I sent it to the at me.com if that was the right one. Yes, I got it. Okay. You guys are good to go whenever you want. Okay, great. I'll read the statement first. So welcome to the subcommittee of the HB 737 uh, Merrimack um, Commission. This is the health subcommittee uh, the co of the Commission on the Environmental and Public Health Impacts of Perfluorinated Chemicals, RSA 126A79-A. Um, we are meeting today, um, I'm Mindy Mesmer, uh, and we are meeting today, um, before we get started, I'll read through the checklist to ensure that the meeting we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of this subcommittee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and listen to this meeting um, on YouTube and via the phone and also on the Zoom um, platform by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We've provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remotesenate at leg.state.nh.us or call the phone number 603-271-3043. In the event that the public is unable to access this meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done via roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call of attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Um, I guess, is there someone first that will um, volunteer to take notes during the meeting? And if so, that person could do the roll call. Okay. <laughs> I think, and uh, just again, to remind you guys that we have, we'll have it up on YouTube to right. watch again for notes and we have a recording for you too. Right. Okay, well, I will take the role then. Um, Re Rebecca DeVries, not here. Nancy Olson Murphy, Representative Nancy Olson Murphy. Here, I'm at home. There are other family members around, but not in the room. Uh, Representative Gary Woods. <clears throat> um, yes, I'm, um, at, I'm, I'm here uh, and I'm home alone in my study. Representative Wendy Thomas, not, a bit, not here. Um, Nancy Harrington. Hi, I'm in Rhode Island. I'm, I am alone. Amy Costello. I'm here. I'm in Dover and I'm alone. Kids in and out. And Kathleen Bush. Hello, I'm here. I'm in my office in Concord alone. And I'm Mindy Mesmer. <clears throat> I'm here in my home, in my office alone in Rye, New Hampshire. Great. <clears throat> oh, it looks like Representative Wendy Thomas just joined us. We'll give her a second. Yeah, I'm all set. Uh, and I'm alone in Merrimack. And you are, can you state your name, please? Uh, Representative Wendy Thomas. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, we have not been able to meet, obviously, for several months due to the pandemic. Um, so we are tasked with summarizing um, our thoughts um, for inclusion in the report. 
Uh, so that's one of the items on the agenda today. But first I wanted to um, discuss the response from DHHS on the request that this committee, the subcommittee brought forward uh, regarding the blood samples um, that were taken during the 2000, I can't remember the date, but um, you guys probably know better than I, uh, that were taken uh, and the fact that we would we had asked for them to be held. So um, I'd like to open it up to entertain any conversation on this topic. Is there anyone that would like to comment on the letter that we received in response? Looks like we've got some hands raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Mindy is, a, oh, go ahead. How do I see them? <clears throat> I'm just looking at the people. Oh yeah, no, there are no hands raised. Uh, in sorry, the just physical hands. Just physical oh, hands. okay, <laughs> sorry. Hi, uh, Amy. Um, Representative Woods, I think you had your hand raised before I did. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. I, um, I was just gonna ask if it's something that you could share on screen. Oh, sure, absolutely. You did not see it yet? <clears throat> I may or may not have. There's been a lot of material. Got it. Here's the first um, page of it. And uh, while I while you read that, we'll um, go to uh, Representative Woods, Gary, for the comments or question. Uh, no, I, I uh, was pleased with uh, what uh, was reported. Um, it, it raised some of the secondary issues um, and also the fiscal note. Um, and so my, my question is, uh, um, uh, assuming this were to go forward, uh, what, what are the practical difficulties of giving, getting even this sort of relatively small amount into the budget? That's a good question. What was the amount? I can't remember. I'm looking for the... It's not letting me share the pages at the same time. It's really Let's fun. see. Um, a, to a total of ten thousand eight hundred and fifteen dollars. Um, I presume that's uh, annualized. So that's. Um, hold on a second. It's not still not doing it. Um, so that was for um, ten thousand dollars for one year. Uh, well, that, that's my assumption. My question is, there, uh, in addition, uh, the, the sample budget included additional annual costs for electricity and rent, um, uh, and then second, secondarily, some additional costs, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for other storage and shipments. Um, and I, and my, I guess my baseline question is, how realistic, even, in, even with this small amount, uh, getting it into the budget? Well, and this, I can maybe clarify. So I don't think it would be an annual cost, right? The biggest, um, so it was some staff time to kind of sort through samples um, and then some cost for postage because we need to mail the letters out to everyone. The biggest cost is on the third page um, at the bottom there, sort of an attachment is the $8,000 for a freezer. So obviously once that cost was incurred, um, you know, we wouldn't need to do that again. So it's really... It, and this is where I think the discussion of like, well, what do we think we want to do with these samples? And just from a sort of legal and ethical perspective, if we're going to reconsent participants, we need to have a reason for doing that, right? Because what they originally consented to was to participate in the study and then have their samples destroyed. And so it, and I think, I don't know that if, if what we want to do right now is move forward with reconsenting. And then, you know, that is sort of a simple next step with minimal cost. Once we know how many people would reconsent, then we know how many samples we would need to store, then we know what size freezer, right? So you can kind of see how this might be a phased approach. Um, and then, right, the, the big unknown is if there's a future study, then we would need to reconsent them all again to participate specifically in that study. And then there would be additional staff time to kind of sort the samples, send the samples and all of that. So that's where we really at this point just need some additional clarification. We didn't know perhaps, right? If there was some other study out there that's 
I don't know, happening in Boston or happening somewhere that you all knew about that you specifically wanted to be a part of, or if this is just sort of a general request in the event that something should come to fruition in the future. And so I think that um, it's kind of where we are, but I don't know, I don't know that moving forward with reconsenting necessitates funding right away. So I don't want us to feel like we can't move forward if the budget is too much of an issue. Okay, hey, Gary. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a different question. If if going forward, um, the people needed to be, um, uh, we had had another study, shall we say, and they wanted to and they would have to be uh, then um, uh, reassessed and consent again. Um, would it be better to take a secondary uh, second sample, uh, given that we have the data uh, from this set of samples, uh, and that's a picture in time at the time when they were uh, sampled? Uh, at a future study, uh, would that give us even more data uh, and and better data if we were to you know say have another sample and have a comparison? Yeah, I, so can I just interject for a second? So we had a, lo a lot of discussion. I, I think Representative Mer Nancy, do you want to speak to this? Oh yeah, I, I thank you, uh, Mindy. I um, I think we don't know what we don't know, and I think when we look back four years ago, and uh, nobody knew about this chemical at all until we found it in our drinking water and uh, it became public knowledge. Um, so I, you know, when when writing that bill, the, the consideration was um, having the data that we're going to need going forward, and these blood samples actually are a really good source of data um, that we don't necessarily know what blood tests we'll be, you know, using them for in, in the future. Um, I would hate to think that we wouldn't have access to them, um, so that for comparison purposes, for health impacts, for um, the data that, that we'll need to know later that we'll say, oh, if we only had blood samples uh, that were taken closer to you know, the time when this was first exposed as to five years from now or two years from now when, when a, a study, you know, an, another option for a study becomes available. Um, so given the expense, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's minimal, I don't know you know, we don't, certainly don't know how many people will consent. Um, I, I think in Merrimack, I think we'll probably have a pretty good response to consent because people are really concerned and really want to know, um, you know, what's what's you know what kind of health impacts there are. Um, so, you know, I I, um, I think it's important that we save uh, these samples. You know, and 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 so you know, offering people the the, um, the opportunity to reconsent would you know is the first step. Um, and I think just because we don't know what tests we may be using them for, or um, I, I, I would hate to think that we lost a valuable tool um, in the study of these chemicals and in large exposed populations like we have here in Merrimack. Nancy? I think you're on mute still, Nancy. Oh, no, I was all finished. So that was it. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. I think you're on mute, Nancy. Yep, sorry about that. Okay. okay, so in summary, my personal opinion is, I understand you need to have the rationale to be able to continue to freeze and then the possibility of future um, costs, requests. Basically, we want to be able to save these samples in order to be used to compare to present and future comparable studies and any other evaluation related to any yet unidentified health issues. And that's my opinion that encompasses right now. Now I do believe the suggestion by Representative Woods is a wonderful one. It could be done in addition to what I just said because longitudinal studies certainly have value. And that's, and the, what I talked about, the comparison with other comparable studies would be useful for, again, a longitudinal study as well. So I, I'm not saying we shouldn't entertain the suggestion by Representative Woods, but I think alone, there's certain, this kind of rationale to request the maintaining of it. And I think that, as you said, Nancy, I believe the residents of Merrimack would concur with that. I don't think they'd need any more. 
rationale than that to be able to consent to it. That's all. Um, Gary? Uh, so I, I don't mean to say that I, I'm against doing it. I'm just trying to look at both sides. As I used to tell my kids, they came in with an argument and I'd say, what's the other side of the argument? And they'd, duh. I said, well, until you can argue both sides, by definition, you're prejudiced. So I'm trying to look at both sides. Um, and uh, one of the other issues, and uh, I don't think it would be an issue, is, is the potential for degradation. Over time, everything degrades. And, um, and I, I, I don't think that would be a limiting factor, uh, but at least a question that I think would, would, would come up about the time frame of degradation. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Katie. So I apologize for not sending this sooner, but if you remember at the large meeting, there was talk of the um, New Hampshire trace study and how we've kind of learned from right our experience and that now we do actually ask for consent to keep and store samples. I just sent that document to you, Mindy. I'm sorry, if you could please circulate that to the whole commission at some point, maybe with notes from this subcommittee meeting, but I could read that all to you or I could even pull it up on the screen. I think that this actually, you know, with the justification that you all are discussing right now and this language that now has sort of been vetted through the department, we may be, you know, we may have what we need to move forward. So I could just read this, it's quite lengthy, but um, so it just says, may we keep your samples? No, my sample will be destroyed when the study has been completed. Or yes, I agree to have my blood and urine samples de-identified and tested for other contaminants or health indicators in the future. De-identified means my name and other identifying information will be removed. Therefore, I will not receive any test results from additional testing because my sample will have been de-identified, meaning we can no longer contact you. However, my sample will help further the knowledge of chemical contamination in New Hampshire and the United States. This means my sample could be used for future research studies without additional informed consent from me or my parent or guardian. It's just careful you're... if you're on mute. I can't tell if folks are. Yeah, yep, so, are on mute. So on the one hand, it, it helps us keep the door open in a very sort of general sense. Um, the con, of course, is that it's de-identified. And so individual people would no longer have access to those results. So pros and cons there. So. Anyone? Representative Thomas? Um, yeah, two points. Um, Gary brought up um, uh, uh, decompensation, and, and, I, and I wonder about that. I mean, I know these are forever chemicals, but um, I have concerns that... Um, that mean um, degradation of the samples? Degradation, that's the word, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just have uh, questions about the results um, if they're extended, um, because we don't, quite frankly, we don't have the science on it right now. So I do have concerns about that. Um, and with regards to um, the form uh, that you were just talking about, Katie, um, if, if we can't notify people of what's in their blood, I think that's a real problem. I mean, isn't that part of what we're trying to do is let people know? So, I mean, I understand we can get, you know, aggregate results, but that's not going to help individuals. Nancy? Murphy? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I actually had the same question. Is there a reason why the, um, the blood samples have to be de-identified? De is there not a way to maybe have, a, have um, participants have a number so that maybe you know, in processing, they're de-identified by number, but at least the participants would know what their number was so that they would have access to, the, to those results? I can't say for certainty why this was the language agreed on, but my, my assumption is that this uh, reduces the need to then reconsent for specific um, tests in the future. So it leaves it open. By de-identifying, we've kind of reduced that barrier so that from a PHI confidentiality perspective, we no longer have to go back one-on-one -on -one every time there might be something new. Uh, and so I think legal and other partners are probably comfortable by de-identifying. It can open the door then for possibilities. If we don't de-identify, I think there will be the necessity that we, every time there's a new study or a new test we wanna do, we need to reconsent each participant and that's gonna come with a resource intensive 
and cost. Representative Woods, I mean, Gary, sorry. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not positive, and maybe uh, Kathy can address this as well. But anytime you get federal dollars, um, IRB comes into place and IRB uh, rules. And I think, as I recall, it's the last time, it's been a while since I've been involved with an IRB, but I think that probably is going to be the mitigating issue uh, in terms of how these are handled uh, in, the, in the long term, especially for a second study, uh, is the IRB requirements. Yeah. It, and so just to be clear, so these people have already received the results of their blood testing, right? For whatever was reported to them at the time that we knew about. But the question is whether or not they, the samples should be continued to be held. And so I just kind of, the whole reason that we wanted to do this was just to ensure the samples weren't thrown away um, while we're all learning more about what's happening and what we need to be looking for. Um, you know. This EPA ORD went out and analyzed the air emissions from those stacks and they found 147 PFAS chemicals that they'd never known about before. So I think it's not, um, you know, I think a, pr a prudent approach for us would be to just make sure we continue to maintain the samples and then figure out later on whether they degrade or whether they don't and, you know, what kind of study is going to be done. But we just want to preserve those samples for the future potential of, of understanding more than we know now about what's happening there. Um, so I don't know under what sort of system they're already still being held. Um, so I kind of wonder why, you know, uh, what the trigger is for, for throwing them out if they're, you know, I just, I don't understand what the departments, I understand what, you know, since we brought this up that you have to answer the questions, but those samples have been held for, several years right now. So all we were trying to do is preserve, continue to preserve them. Um, so that is just my two cents. Nancy, Murphy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does Katie know what, what the trigger is for them to be discarded? Is there, is there, a, is there a time frame or that might help us to understand? I think it's just another lesson learned of setting dates. You know, I think the reality is with legal action happening in different places around the state, I think we weren't sure like when did the PFAS study end, right? MVD certainly, but it was a larger, it was part of a larger, you know, PFAS initiative across the whole state. And that's obviously still ongoing, especially in your regions. And so I think just clarity, we need to be clear in our language in the future of when something ends and maybe just setting a specific date. So that's a, a lesson learned for sure. And so, you know, I, I think, I think at this point, you know, responding to the letter with sort of just acknowledging that there is no specific study um, that we would like to continue to maintain the samples as is being done um, and you know maybe exploring this language from the trace study you could ask the question around the de-identification whether that's a necessary step or does that just simplify the reconsent process I think right but um, that will probably be the next decision point of, okay, if we reconsent, are we required to de-identify because of IRB rules or in our legal team's preferences? And then after that become, is the resource question, right? I think at this point, that's kind of what I see as the decision tree here. But I think at this point, we, you could reply back clarifying the purpose of this and maybe asking for clarification around the need to de-identify um, I have a question for Amy and Gary. Um, I remember that there's some test, uh, I don't remember her name, but it had to do with cancer tumor cells. And it was a similar thing as who owns these samples once they've been collected. I don't think that actually the um, de-identification thing is appropriate, but I just I want to ask you, Gary, if you're smiling, so I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's called Mahila. Um, yes. Right. Uh, study and there have been books written about this. Yes. And it was a rather egregious um, yes. um, oversight uh, of ethics. Um, and uh, as a consequence, the IRB process was completely revamped. Um, I, mean, I mean, completely revamped <laughs> as a result. Um, uh, but that was in the early areas. But that's the, it's the HeLa. Um, I work with the, uh, uh, the cancer and I've forgotten the Harry, Henrietta, 
Uh, yes, Ma- Henrietta. Lactose. Yeah. Yeah, Henry. You haven't read it. It's a great book. It is a great yeah. book. Yeah. So with the, that being said, you know, I, I think this just you know underlines that we all we're asking for. And well, we'll I think I'll take if we need to take a vote on whether to follow up with a letter, just saying we don't know yet what we want to do with the samples, but we want them to be held um, as a follow up. Um, happy to entertain that conversation. I'll make a motion. Uh... As you stated. <laughs> second. Who second? Nancy Herting. Nancy. Murphy. Great. Okay, so is there anyone that can take a first stab at the draft of that letter, knowing that we're gonna have a report also that needs to be done? I can't I after the motion, I'm just gonna add this to the discussion that I, I do have some concerns um, about the budget. We have been warned again and again and again not to bring anything forward that um, will impact the budget as much as we can. Um, and I'm, I just think that unless we have a specific request, um, this, this could get a little iffy. You know, I mean, just sort of saying that we want, we want these samples to be maintained in case, I don't think that's strong enough. I, th- I think we have to come up with something a little more specific, that's all. Gary? Um, I, I agree uh, with the issue of the budget, which you know, I raised myself, but I think uh, two parts uh, to the legislation is uh, to create good policy. And then the second is to sort of see where that policy fits in. I think we have to understand that uh, what we want to do is what we think is best, uh, given the science uh, and given the circumstances and given the long-term goals. Um, with that uh, said, then we do understand that if in fact uh, budget constraints are such that this does not reach a level of priority relative to other issues, then we'll have to accept that. Uh, but my sense is I would like to see the motion go forward uh, and cross that bridge when we get to it relative to the budget, knowing that we've offered what we think is the best policy uh, for the situation. I'm okay with that. I see a lot of shaking heads. Do we wanna take a vote on this? I call the roll? Okay. Representative Woods? Yes. Nancy Murphy? Yes. Nancy Harrington? Yes. Representative Thomas? Yes. Amy Costello? Yes. And Kathleen Bush? I will abstain. And I will vote yes. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Uh, uh, actually, Katie, what the plans are in terms of the uh, the biomonitoring, the trace study? Um, uh, what are, what's the the plan for those um, specimens? Are they so that's where this language around yes, we can keep your samples, but they'll be de-identified. And so, um, certainly, when the biomonitoring team is ready to report their results, I think they could report to you maybe the breakdown of people who responded. Uh, to that reconsent, which would be interesting to know. So, um, do we do we yet have a, a like a date sense of when those results are going? When when the participants will be notified? Sure, I saw a draft report today, so it's it's getting close. Um, I'll optimistically say this calendar year. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I'm sure there's not much for DHHS to be doing right now, but. Right, we're eager. <laughs> All right, so it, uh, that being said, um, is anyone going to um, be able to volunteer to write that letter or draft for us to look at? I guess since I uh, propose that uh, and my wife says, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> it's, it should be a one page letter. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do <laughs> if you won't tell my wife. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. And right, just so- as a reminder for Representative Woods, in our response, right, we have just a couple key questions. So I feel like, you know, the template is there. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. I'll give you a call, Kathy. So I'm not sure the process then for that. So do we have to... How do we handle that? Um, we will. I guess we'll have to bring the draft back to us um, in the next meeting, 
and then uh, work through it together in public. Okay. Um, moving on then to, I just thought it might be good to go back and review the slides that we presented um, to the bigger commission a few months ago before the pandemic changed everything. And um, because we need to move into what kind of information we want to report into the fuller commission from this subcommittee. So um, I thought it might be good to go back and look at what our charge was and also just sort of review it and then talk about what we want to include in the report. So I have um, apologize for this. I don't know what is going on with my computer, but it's not being, can you guys all see the slide? Okay. Yes. Um, so our responsibilities were to assess and implement steps necessary to investigate public health impacts from exposure to PFAS contaminated air, soil, and water. Um, and we were both mostly working in this responsibility realm here um, in this committee because we felt that we, that's, this is kind of where we've been sitting. The other things that we were charged with, we have not really been able to sufficiently get into. Um, so for future work in this subcommittee, that's probably where we're going to start to hopefully move in um, to that area, those areas. Um, we just had some review. We had some people come to visit and speak with us about um, some of the various areas that we were interested in, including some of the radiological monitoring, the laboratory. Uh, Katie Bush came and spoke about the environmental public health tracking system. We had ATSDR speak with us and we had Jonathan Ailey go through how the MCLs were derived, which are now in force um, and uh, the case dissolved against them. So um, we then heard from Representative Murphy about um, the PFAS blood testing program that happened and sort of a review of what the health impacts may be, the exposure uh, to the people in Merrimack. Um, the conversations around the fact that no health study had really been done to appropriately assess the exposure um, and related uh, illnesses in the town area, in the areas affected, how uh, the community had taken it upon themselves to do a, their own door-to-door -door health survey, which was published in a journal, a peer-reviewed journal, and how in 2018, the state did a cancer uh, statistical review of the Merrimack area, which compared the cancer rates. I'm going to try to remember what they were for a 10 year period compared to uh, incidence rates compared to the greater state values. So, those numbers of incidence rates of cancers, I think it was 10 or 12 different kinds of cancers, were compared to the state averages. Um, we heard from DHHS that they're limited in their capacity to do serum blood testing for PFAS, although they do have a 60 to 80 serum um, sample test per month um, capacity to expand uh, for PFAS blood testing, uh, but they don't have the staff necessary to ne necessarily be able to um, address that capacity, expand that capacity. Um, we heard from um, Gary Woods about the AMA's resolutions, actually two that were passed, uh, that had to do with physician um, education on PFAS-related exposure and, and illness, um, and we we're happy to hear from him about that. And we also uh, talked about what we're doing. We did, number one, we asked for the serum samples, which we just discussed. We also asked um, some questions about that, and the um, some of the... Um, looked at some of the scientific studies and the trace study uh, to maybe look at uh, important information uh, relevant to the people of Merrimack. Um, don't know what, oh, so this was a question, number three, uh, Representative Murphy was that we wanted to see that uh, correspondence came to this health subcommittee, which we, or to the commission as a whole, but not sure we've seen a ton of that um, could be pandemic related, but some of the St. Cobain variants issues and things did come to the larger commission, which we have discussed, but um, I don't know that the state has done any additional health analysis of uh, related that we should discuss here. Katie, do you happen to know if there's anything that's happened in the interim that we should know about? No, I think at the last large commission meeting, as part of my updates, I, I shared that I think, you know, the ATSDR work happening and the, the health risk assessment 
last time I spoke with ATSDR, they were working on that. And so certainly when that is finalized, if that, I think we can bring it to the commission um, and, so and those there keys were, work to the extent that that is relevant to this commission. Right. There were two though, there was a public and then the private wells, right? And neither one of those are complete or? That's my understanding, yeah. Um, we asked some of the questions listed on this slide. Um, these are still relevant. And I think these, we don't particularly have answers to some of these, but I do think that we should include these items in our report, um, that these are things we discussed that we think are relevant and should be followed through, or we would like to see some of these things followed through, at least discussed um, with respect to the Merrimack. Um, exposure, which include the consultations, which we just discussed, um, whether or not ATSDR could form a community assistant panel. I believe that was requested by Nancy Murphy. Um, could cooperative agreements be um, in state reinstated between ATSDR and New Hampshire to do some of the public health analysis that we think needs to be done? Can four Merrimack area hospitals be included in ATSDR grand rounds? And I think that initial answer was yes. Um, so we, it would be great if we could get an update on that somehow from ATSDR. Um, and can ATSDR connect with New Hampshire Med to provide information on PFAS related health um, information? Um, I think they said they could, um, and there was some discussion around that happening, but I'm not sure that it's actually been followed through. So there was some conversation before the pandemic uh, to try to get some financial assistance from federal representatives to cover the costs of additional serum testing. Uh, I don't know that we ever got, um, I don't know that we ever got a final answer. Um, if anybody is aware of that, please let me know. I know we had some conversations with some of the staff or the federal representatives about this, but I don't think I recall ever seeing a final answer about whether they could assist us. Okay, um, I'm seeing no. Uh, monitor PFAS related health legislation in general court, which of course due to the pandemic was severely impacted. Um, in particular, uh, Nancy Murphy's bill that was intended to um, look at um, physician um, um, education around PFAS exposure uh, was a victim of the uh, COVID crisis as well as bottled water bill that um, represented Cushing filed that was to look at um, PFAS levels being regulated in bottled water, which was important um, and I believe is being refiled. Um, if there's anything I'm missing, please chime in. Monitor the results of national health studies and vaccine efficacy studies. Those are ongoing, somewhat impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Um, but we did get some interesting information. Nancy Murphy, do you want to interject here on the, uh, what we discussed about the um, birth weight, low birth weight information that we just heard about? You're on mute. Sure. Uh, uh, much of the, the challenge that we've had is um, showing a cause and effect relationship between exposure and outcomes and the data, uh, you know, peer reviewed science data has not been available to us. And a uh, recently a, a report came out um, indicating a, di a direct link between cause uh, and effect impact on um, birth weight, um, uh, uh, reproductive um, outcomes that, that babies that were um, born once the PFAS was, um, controlled in, in their public water. Uh, so limiting their exposure of PFAS to, to mothers, that baby's birth weight was was uh, improved. Um, and I don't remember the, the number of, uh, of study participants, but it was it was finally a, a causal link. And that's that gives us great hope because this hopefully will be the, the first of many um, studies that will actually give us the data and the proof that that has been um, that we know is there, but just we we have just haven't had the science to prove it. So um, we're certainly on the right track. It's um, you know it's it's you know we've come a long way in the four years that that we've known about this, and 
this hopefully will be the beginning of, of uh, lots of science that, that shows what, unfortunately, what, what I think we already know. Question, Nancy? Sure. May I? Yes, you may. In the study you're just talking about, you talked about birth weight and then reproductive outcomes. Was the reproductive outcomes related to the mothers or the children or what? Do you know, what was the specifics about that? I believe it looked at exposure, maternal exposure to PFAS and then uh, birth outcomes. Okay, but it was mentioned about reproductive outcomes. I just wanted to know what was meant by that. If you don't know, that's fine. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, no, I, that, yeah no, I think what I, what I was trying to say was was sort of the maternal child thing that the birth weight. So it was it was okay. on the on the on the, the the baby rather than the, the very mother. good. Thank you. And so we sort of outlined steps necessary to assess exposure related health issues, PFAS serum blood testing, agency health study survey, looking at vaccine efficacy studies and breastfeeding um, recommendations. Um, and so we had this list of future tasks of the full commission uh, proposals that we had uh, to go to the full commission. Uh, and some of these don't you know, we have not made any progress on them because of the, um, the pandemic, like working in parallel with other subcommittees. I think this is the second subcommittee to meet since the pandemic. Um, looking at existing rules and regulations, that can be part of a proposed, uh, <clears throat> if people want to suggest some proposals as we get into talking about the report. Um, the air permitting process we've been working with um, the commission, the larger commission on uh, health and environmental subcommittees to look at. We got we got a presentation from. We didn't have a presentation from MVD, did we? It stopped. We were going to, and we were going. To, yeah. So I think that should be raised again as a as a um, suggested for further action. Um, we also had quite a bit of discussion on updating the cancer rates in the Merrimack area, um, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, write a follow up letter to ATSDR with requests. Um, we did not do that, I don't believe. I remember there was a draft that somebody was working on, but I don't remember that it ever went. Um, and then some of these other issues that we want to obtain information, request from DHHS. Trace, we just talked about Trace, Silent Spring. We did not have them come. And I know that that study has been somewhat impacted by the pandemic. Um, financial support for serum testing and review AMA resolution, which I believe we did do at one of our meetings. Okay. Does anyone wanna talk about these? So SB 623 was rolled into HB 1264 and signed into law. So that's fantastic. Um, HB 1456, I believe was ITL'd. And HB 1538, was Nancy's bill that was ITL'd as, as a, um, actually, no, that we had just, um, yes. Does um, either Nancy or Gary, do you wanna comment on that, Gary? Uh, it went to interim study uh, yeah. and interim study uh, was elected not to proceed at the moment uh, with further uh, legislative activity, uh, feeling that it would be uh, independently raised and part of the, with the commission actually uh, working as well uh, uh, it was uh, left to no further legislation. However, Nancy Murphy, do you want to comment? Oh yeah, I, I my understanding, uh, Gary, was that um, I know Representative Weber, I think, and uh, Representative Salloway thought it was really important that that um, that the 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 language be sort of absorbed someplace, and I, I think the recommendation was that it. Oh, the only reason for the no further legislation was not because of the, the the bill was not supported. It was indeed supported, but that that it be absorbed basically and sort of as a subcommittee of Senate Bill eighty five. So it it wasn't different than the the recommendation being made not to go forward, not because it shouldn't go forward, but because there was a venue to have that happen within a commission already. Correct, Gary? Is that? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't articulate very well, not to go forward with that as an independent piece of legislation, 
but yes, uh, you know, Solway did uh, point out, and we all did, that this is a, an important process. Uh, and uh, the chronic diseases uh, with, under Tom Sherman, <clears throat> Senate Bill 85, was felt to be the place to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, uh, depending upon how that was carried out, independent legislation could come forward as a fresh piece in the next legislation, that legislature. I'm going to say one more thing. Um, the other thing that is just important to note is that I know when I was drafting that bill, I uh, reached out to Senator Shaheen uh, uh, in her office. And um, one of the issues that when Gary and I had met with New Hampshire Medical Society and everybody, the issue was around funding for that. That was the big, um, which often is the problem for a lot of our, our uh, legislation. But um, Senator Shaheen has a bill. She actually came to me. Merrimack to meet with us to discuss. She said, being aware of that was an issue, she brought that and made a federal, um, uh, or, I mean, put in a, a bill that, of course, has not yet passed, but would um, supply funding for just that reason. So that may be available to us hopefully in the future. And, and I know New Hampshire Medical Society was was uh, on board and aware of that part of that discussion. So, um, you know, where it's where this comes, where that will be heard and where it will sit for sort of oversight is sort of up in the air. But, you know, the things behind the scenes are in place to, to, to make it happen. Katie? Just because I'm newer to this commission, is anyone working with Dartmouth? I, my recollection is that there's a work group out of Dartmouth and I think Karen Craver and Dr. Ben Chan around developing educational materials for providers on PFAS, right? That I think maybe came out of this group, but then Dartmouth. And so is anyone on this group, on that group or? Okay, I don't know if there's an update there, but that seems to me to like be the pilot of how this commission engages and you know with the medical society and maybe this first piece is focused on PFAS, but then maybe SB 85 can help identify other contaminants or other topics that we then want to work with sort of a third party on developing outreach materials. And then of course it's how do we get those outreach materials in front of people, but so. I guess a question Gary. for an update there, because it seems I'm just trying to put the pieces together. Gary, did you want to? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, I, I, I contacted um, uh, John Alley and because um, I needed the names and that's a Dartmouth Superfund program and the Silent Spring Institute were the two. Um, of note is uh, that there was a proceedings of a workshop, which uh, I've forgotten exactly how I got a hold of this, but it's uh, it, it was August of this year, uh, uh, titled "Understanding, Controlling, and Preventing Exposure to PFAS," and proceedings of a workshop, and that was published uh, uh, by the National Academy Press um, uh, under the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, and that was a very productive workshop, uh, and addresses many of the um, issues that we've uh, talked about but uh, including education. Uh, Rosanna Thomas. Yes, um, so um, the group that you're talking about is something that um, Representative Suzanne Vale and I started, um, I think two summers ago. And it was with Lori Reardon um, and she lost part of her funding. So, and then COVID happened and everything, but um, there were, there were a group of us, including um, uh, DA, uh, DHHS, uh, DES, uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, the Boston University was there as well. Um, there were some uh, people from the medical school of Dartmouth-Hitchcock as well. Um, and the, the charge, we were, we were developing uh, information for the general public, how to reduce your PFAS load. Um, and I'd have to look it up. There was going to be one piece for pregnant women what to look out for, um, how to protect your baby using bottled water, that kind of thing. Um, there was gonna be another general piece on just how PFAS gets into the environment. Um, so people could be aware that it's in the water, it's in the air, it's in the soil. Um, and then we were talking about also providing uh, some information to physicians and um, medical providers. And we were just bringing in some physicians and some pediatric nurses when COVID hit. So I don't even know what the, um, what the progress is right now um, because things are still sort of in the air, but, but that's the group you're talking about. And 
and we had we we had good plans um and then life happened okay so what i i can do is follow up with um karen and john here at the agencies sort of get an update if they've heard at all where that is as well as connect with atsdr going back to some of the earlier points mindy made so i can work on um, some general updates that help us, I think, check off some of those activities. We had made significant progress. Um, we were um, looking for some funding and that kind of, and then it all dried up too. But uh, yeah, that would, that's a good, a good group to check in with. Okay, any other comments? So I was just trying to, um, put some of these bullet items into an outline for the report um, and wanted to sort of discuss how this, our, our section of the report should be um, um, organized. So I came up with the beginning of that. Um, summarize, oh, I'll share my screen if I can do it. Okay, summary of meetings and findings. We're, thought we should summarize the blood test requests that we made. Um, sorry, but I'm having difficulty with this. Oh, summarize the presentations that the committee heard, uh, referencing our meeting agenda and our, and our minutes. Um, summary of meetings. Uh, completed tasks, what we've completed. I was about to do that. Uncompleted tasks recommendations for the, the further for further work, which um, we had kind of been discussing uh, and more evaluation on chronic health issues in the um, Merrimack area, as well as proposed legislation. So this is just kind of the, the skeleton of the report. And I was hoping that um, if anyone has any comments on what the skeleton should include, uh, any, any other items, and then work from there on what uh, we can write about, if we can write about it. Does anyone have any other comments for what should be included in the report? Well, just to clarify, so the under uh, AC there, um, uncompleted task part C, so the cooperative agreement has been reinstated, right? As of April 1st, we are an awardee of the ATSDR Apple Tree Grant. It's a collaborative grant between DES and DHHS. And so that that's great, I think, and that gives us a conduit, I think, to engage the communities. And so I think we could discuss as a group how to engage now that we have that grant back in place. And then the other two points around ATSDR, like I said, I'm happy to follow up on those either with ATSDR directly or with Karen and John who have historically been a, a link there and hopefully in time for the report, move those into completed tasks. These two last items. Probably B, oh, probably all of them, at least B and D. Not, I don't know anything about the Grand Rounds piece. Oops, I can check. Okay, so those might move in. Um, can you just refresh our memory? Um, some of the people on this call don't know what the Apple Tree Grant will give, will do. So can you just give us a little bit of a, an overview on that again? Sure, sorry, I don't have that in front of me. So. Um, Sorry. But in general, the ATSDR grant supports sort of two pieces, sort of the historic traditional site assessments that DES will do that, you know, the state obviously has a list of priority sites, both federally and state identified hazardous sites. There's also a conduit for communities to engage with us where there are concerns. So I feel like that this project fits into that category. And then there's a new separate piece that's focused specifically on safe siting of childcare facilities. And that part of the project is really sitting with my program at the health department to incorporate environmental health criteria into the safe siting of childcare facilities across the state. So there's sort of the traditional site investigations and engagement with communities and education and outreach. And the second component focus on childcare facilities. Um, I was just reminded, we, we did ask ATSDR a number of these questions, I think. And so I just came across an email with some updates from Tara Summers from ATSDR. So Mindy, I will forward those. I, th you know, I think those originally came out probably at the beginning of the pandemic. I will forward those on again and 
those could also be shared and probably inform some of these points. One second, I'm sorry. Um, um, any other suggested um, parts of this report? I'm sorry, I'll fix this and make it right. I just don't want to take time to do it now. But so, summary of what meetings we had. Uh, correspondence we send out, completed tasks that we've done, that we set out to do, uncompleted tasks that need to be done still, um, recommendations for what we think is a good, uh, good things to try to do in the future, uh, and maybe a summary of proposed legislation if we want to make any recommendations about that. Any other comments about significant uh, big chunks of the report? Does anyone want to take on uh, doing um, so? The the what was the date that um, the senator had wanted this to be complete by? It was um, October thirty first or something? No, October fifteenth. Or I'm getting my commissions mixed up. Was it October thirtieth? The policy group is meeting September twenty fourth. Oh, okay. So they. Um, I'm not sure about the communication because so they needed to have the subcommittee reports in so that they could pull it all together. So they want this in before the end of September then, is that what you're saying? Right. right. Okay. Um, so before the 20, what, I'm sorry, what were the dates you said? All I know is the policy and that was, excuse me. And that was September 24th. I don't know about the communications meeting now. I'm trying to think who went first. I think I have that written down. Uh, communications is the second, October 2nd at 10 a.m. Correct. I yeah, just found it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so calendar. we should have our report into the policy committee, which is the 24th because they're going to pull it together. And then the communications committee is going to take over. Right, Nancy? Uh, because that's, that's why they had to do the communication subcommittee meeting after the policy. I guess I got kind of confused with all the talk on that. I know. <laughs> the deadlines that day. I wasn't quite yeah. sure about what was decided. Um, we had to reconfigure, you're right. Yeah. So, okay, in any case, we're looking at um, a couple of weeks where we should probably get this pulled together. I'm not sure if we can have another meeting before that or not. Um, we could ask the Senate staff if we could have one more meeting to just sort of get together. If we go, if we each could take a section of this um, and come together with our sections on that next meeting date, that would probably be um, the most efficient way to do it um, rather than try and write it here. But is, is there anyone that has any, um, would like to take on one of these sections starting right off? Can I have a request? Mindy, yes. I, I was missing from the meeting where you did the report and I did not get a copy of your PowerPoint. Could you send that to me, please? Sure. Because I think that was a terrific jumping off point for this report. Yep. Um, the one we just talked about, right? Right. And I think there should be just a, obviously a generalized statement introducing the report, talking about because of the coronavirus pandemic, the health subcommittee has been very limited. I just think just trying to make that statement prior to the report puts it all in perspective from that on in. Yeah. That could be discussed in uh, section two. 
Yep. All right, so uh, does anyone have any desires to take on one of these sections in particular? Nancy, would you be willing to work on number two with me? Sure. Sure. We can test Absolutely. Samples. Yeah. We could just, we can probably get, because really a lot of it has to do with your work already. And we can summarize what we've talked about today in terms of the samples and what our future goals would be related to it. Yeah. We could summarize the presentations, which which basically Mindy has already done on that. Yeah, maybe keep, it's yeah. a beautiful summary. So yep, that memory, can be done Mindy, pretty quickly. Can you send that out to everybody again, Mindy? Because I, I think yep. that it, that's that's really a good organizational framework for everything. I agree, really? Nancy. Yeah, sounds good, Nancy. Okay, you've got my number. I don't think I have yours. And then, Mindy, I'm I, happy to send you an update, just a summary of the. ATSDR projects, Katie Bush. And I, I think the email I just forwarded you from ATSDR addresses many of the other points. So maybe you and I can work on those pieces. Okay, so you and I, Katie? Yeah, if you need any clarification, but I, I, I think many of these questions are in this email and I think it just got lost in the flurry of early. Yes, probably. It can be done. <laughs> Like many, like many things these days. Uh, who can take on the uncompleted tasks section? I'm going to suggest that I'm going to suggest that Amy and I work on recommendations. Is that okay, Amy? And anybody else that wants to is fine too. But I was hoping that Amy could help. Um, do you have the bandwidth for that, Amy? Um, I, I might. <laughs> You're going to do it. <laughs> I'm involved with the UNH reopening. So my life has oh. changed significantly. Yes. Well, I, how about I will take a first stab at it and look for your comment. I'll make it as, as easy as I can, but I think your voice on this is important. That would be super. Thank you very okay. much for me. Anyone else that wants to join in is, is fine with that too, if you want to. Um, uh, I'll do the uncompleted tasks. Okay. And Mindy, just as a, a thought on the recommendations, can we have a strong tie to the SB85 and the new um, maybe Shaw ship, the state health assessment, state health improvement? Um, Sorry, say that again. I'm sorry. I think it's um, I think it's Tom Sherman's new bill um, that's related to the state health assessment and state health improvement plan um, that might help with kind of pulling together some of the synergies around identifying chronic health issues. Can you send that to me? I don't know. I'm not. From, I can't. You keep cutting out, so I'm not. And I'm not oh, familiar okay. with the, what you just said, or maybe it's my hearing. I, yep. I will feed it in when you, or I'll edit what you send me. Okay. Yeah. Do you happen to know the bill number that you're talking about? No. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Just the content. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go off video. Maybe that'll help. Well, that's weird. I just lost. I can it. send you the information, Mindy. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. No problem. I forgot you were there. You were a ghost <laughs> behind the placard. Um, <laughs> a wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> um, does um, anyone want to take a stab at the proposed legislation? Um, this is kind of a, maybe if we all sort of think on this and provide, because I think um, there's some thoughts already out there. Um, maybe if we all sort of have somebody collate this information into one place, is how well, this is section should be done. Isn't Nancy holding a meeting about this, this very topic? Nancy Murphy. Yep. Um, the um, the the House um, uh, has recommended, given the state of affairs and Zoom meetings, et cetera, that we limit legislation 
as much as we can. Um, and so it has uh, coordinated the ability of different um, of, of groups to meet and sort of to address content areas where we where we're looking um, to to bring forth legislation. And one of those areas is, of course, around PFAS. Um, so I think it's actually I just don't have it with me right now, but in October we have a meeting um, scheduled where anybody interested in filing PFAS related legislation uh, will get together and sort of discuss you know, how, how best to do that, how to do it most effectively and sort of prioritizing our needs. Um, but I think it will be helpful for us to be able to, Wendy, uh, to actually bring that, you know, what we see here as needs to discuss at that, at that meeting. Um, so, you know, certainly the ready recommendations we would have would be, that would be a great place to, to, uh, to, to bring it. Yeah, so I, I think if there's any, to the extent that there are any ideas among us, um, or just to list them here in the report would be good. So they're brought to the commission for discussion and then the commission can may or may not recommend or support anything, but at least people know what we're thinking of. Um, so um, does anyone have any ideas right now? Should we, represent Thomas? Yeah, so I just submitted um, a bill and I've spoken with Nancy Murphy about this. Um, and it's a standalone bill, not combined with other PFAS bills. Um, and what it would do, it would extend the statute of limitations for civil cases for PFAS injuries from three years to six years. Um, and so I just put that in. That would, that would help people that, that think they've been harmed physically um, by PFAS. But more importantly, it would really help water districts um, in particular uh, the town of Merrimack, because we're bumping right against that three year limit right now. And we just haven't had the science to, to do the work necessary to bring it forward. So um, I've spoken with some of the commissioners, I've spoken to environmental lawyers. Um, it's based on a bill that, that uh, was just um, discussed in Maine. So um, it, it's an important bill that I think ties into this commission because because of health injuries and water. Any other ideas? Uh, I've already, I've also uh, refiled a couple of uh, PFAS bills that were actually passed the House and Senate um, that were just caught up in the pandemic. Um, and the first one was uh, related to the AFFF firefighting foam. Um, and even though that's not the issue in this particular incident, the, the health impacts are, are certainly um, uh, concerning and related. So that would, the, the point of that, this bill is, is really assessing um, locations, sites of use, spills, dumps, leaks of that. And then so that we, my hope would be that we can overlay with you know GIS mapping, mapping kind of the locations of, of that um, exposure to that firefighting foam and the health impacts as well. So although it's not you know the the air kind of emissions, it's 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 still related. Um, and the other one was just actually updating uh, statute to uh, reflect PFAS to encompass both the the per and polyfluoral alcohols because right now our statute is I mean uh, is just. PFCs, so it's just the perfluorinated chemicals. That was just so, a housekeeping modification, right, to the HB twelve sixty four. What is that the one you're talking about? Uh, no, no, just in, um, and I don't, I don't have the, the, uh, the statute. It was just actually DES had brought it to my attention a while ago that um, the law as written right now only allows them to, um, uh, to set MCLs etc for perfluorinated chemicals um, and so we we've the legislation mine, with their support um, was to ch change that to um, not that they're necessarily going to do that but to to at least have the statute reflect that that um, that that's a, that that's a possibility to, to regulate both PFAS and uh, uh, per polyfluoral chemicals so those are the two PFAS bills so one of the things that we had discussed at length was the cancer evaluation and uh, the fact that it was older, we were asking for an update and I had, many of us have questions about 
comparison of those levels to in state numbers rather than national averages. And uh, don't know, Katie, if there is any money in the Apple Tree grant to do that kind of work or does it need, just thinking, do we want to propose or, or suggest proposed legislation for updating the cancer evaluation? Um, do we want to uh, look at possibly a chronic disease registry type of thing for the people of Merrimack so we can start counting and understanding the chronic health impacts, um, the endocrine health impacts or um, any of the other low birth weight or uh, autism, ADHD, special needs spending, those kinds of things. Do we wanna start, do we wanna at least like, do we wanna talk about proposing legislation, understanding that you know it could be shot down due to budgetary issues, but at least we have that conversation um, that raises these issues to the greater general court. That would be my suggestion. Okay. I see one I think I think also just in terms of um, I think to Amy's point earlier around connecting, I think it's maybe S B two seven seven eighteen around the Shaw and the ship, right? I think I think there's a lot of programs already out there and sometimes we just need to align the priorities. And so sometimes it doesn't need to be legislated or funded. It it just needs to be asserted as a priority. And I think our state health assessment is the place to do that. And I think this commission as well as SB 85. Um, so if, if the recommendation is to conduct better surveillance for certain outcomes, then programs can prioritize that. You know, that may not require legislation or funding. So I, I think just from an outside perspective of we don't always need to legislate or fund it. We just need to clarify priorities. Mm. Sometimes the priorities are clarified by legislation. <laughs> this is true. This is true, but but if it doesn't make it through, you know, then yeah. But at least it's discussed. Let me know. Right. Um, yeah. I just sent over an email to you uh, with the legislation. It was 1639, I think, for the assessment yes. advisory council. And then it, for um, the other one, which was SB 85 in 2019, which was the chronically triggered illness. Yeah, one that one, we, we all, many of us serve on that. Yeah, so, um, but it was the 1639. I'll look that up. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Alan. Perfect. There's a link. If you click it in the email, I connected it for you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You're awesome. Um, so, um, uh, that's funny. Every time Alan exposes himself, I get, have to reset my window. <laughs> um, so yes, on updated cancer evaluation and, um, chronic disease, um, registry idea. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Some concerns have been raised over, um, special education funding, mm -hmm. uh, some concerns about endocrine disrupting outcomes, uh, of course, cancer. Um, what other things were we thinking? Low birth weight Low based birth on weight. studies. Um, anything else that we should suggest in that legislation looking at? Well, do you want to go with thyroid and high cholesterol and all of those? Oh yeah, we, so we'll say C8 panel outcomes. How's that? So we capture all six of those or seven, or I think there's six. Um, any so other you have, you have uh, endocrine outcomes, but do you have uh, immune disruption? I mean, generalized autoimmune disease or something like that? How do you, and I'll, I'll, I'll pose this question to, this is a question I've gotten back at me. What kinds of outcomes would you, it's kind of a murky area. So, I mean, we do understand that that's an issue. Is there a way to actually measure that? Do some sort of- yeah, Gary, Gary, what's the name of that test? It's the fluorescent test that, that shows for um, autoimmune disease. Do you remember the name? It's called the ANA test. That's it. That's it. Yep. I mean, that's certainly one. But again, that's that's very nonspecific. It's like taking your temperature. If you got a temperature, does that mean you have an appendicitis, or that means you have the flu, mm -hmm. or do you have bronchitis? Uh, ANA is is a very generalized um, 
survey. Uh, and from there, then you have to do specific uh, uh, specific testing. That's that's just the first, uh, if, yeah. it, if that's positive uh, in the setting of other symptomatology and other chemistries, uh, then you take the next step. Um, and those are uh, oftentimes become DNA studies. But, but Gary, doesn't ANA indicate um, some generalized autoimmune disorder is present? Yeah, yes, that's correct. It just, okay. but it, it's very, very diffuse. And yeah. again, it, it's equivalent, like I say, it's like taking your temperature. Yeah, yeah. so we don't wanna, we don't wanna talk about ways to measure. We wanna look at outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, um, when you say special education, um, is, so that's related to the chronic disease? So what we've noticed is that there, you know, the town of Merrimack in particular has much higher averages of special education funding than on at per pupil averages than other, um, other towns. Um, so when you look at things like arsenic and lead exposure in children, we know that there are, are you know, ADHD and some of the other possible connections to, uh, you know, um, outcomes in children. Okay. So, so you'd be looking for ADHD as the chronic disease marker? Yes. Yep. So this, okay. I shouldn't say funding here. Uh, I should say um, special education. You, well, should special. Be learning, you should be backing up a bit and going to learning disorders um, because it's not so much the funding of special education. It's the diagnosis of, of a learning right. disability. Right. Learning disability. Okay. That's, I was, I was like, one of these things does not look <laughs> Let's try to talk, make that connection. Thank you. And is that founded in the literature as well? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And is there a tight list um, that CDC produces that are related to PFAS? The way that we found the list for the environmental health conditions, I think it was NIEHS had published a list of things that they look for outcomes that they look for related to environmental health? Well, the science um, you know, is kind of evolving as we speak. So there is the C8 science panel list of yeah. outcomes, probable, okay. um, but there's also, you know, there's, there, I don't know of myself, I don't know a comprehensive list right now where I don't know that anybody's done a, um, um, I forgot the word, but, um, I don't know that there, anybody's come up with a full list right now of yes, we now think because the science has supported this, that this is related for sure. Um, right. But, you know, we do see a lot of evidence you know, on vaccine efficacy impacts and um, that wouldn't be an outcome we'd be looking at necessarily in this because we won't have a way to know that, but, um, but the science informs, you know. Right, and, yeah, I was just wondering if CDC had published anything lately, as you said, like it's evolving. I don't think so, not to, unless somebody okay. else knows. I don't know a list yet other than the C8 science panel does. Let's say that I will report back, you know, to John Alley and others who are more up to date, I think on that science. And I think the idea of like a systematic review, if there's been an update on the, That's what the was, science essentially, I, yeah. I was trying Thank to- Yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am gonna have to drop off, sorry, at, in a couple of minutes here, I have a 2.30. Okay. Um, so when did you we, want our pieces by, just so I'm sure? So I, there's a, I think what I'll do is I'll get back to everyone on email because I'm not clear on the schedule and how our piece feeds into the commission report. Um, so I'll get back to everyone on the deadlines for these, but um, I think we got it pretty much covered. I think we can write something around. I'm happy to do this. If Gary, you wanna help me with this, propose just a little bit of language on this, that would be great. Um, of this list, or I, I can do it and you can review it. How's that? Uh, good. I'm, I'm not much of a writer, but I'll critique it. <laughs> you can critique it. I know you can do that. <laughs> Mindy, right. yes. the only additional thing is, remember the DHHS had requested enhanced staff to accommodate capacity. Yes. Yeah, so that should be refiled. I'm not sure if Senator Sherman had planned that. Katie, do you know? I don't know, and I think given that we're in a biennium budget, yes. Just having learned from the last time, kind of the importance of aligning with agency that, budgets. Yeah. 
that may be something that's in the future, but it's something that we've identified as a right. need. I mean, we so, can we yeah. can suggest that it's necessary and um, and it can or cannot happen. But I think we're here to suggest what we think should happen. So in a in a ideal world. Okay, well that sounds great. I think we have a good handle on this. I'll just follow up with an email to everyone about you know the basic outline. But of course, this is just a skeleton outline. So if you feel there are other things that needed need to be added to each of these sections, feel free to do that. Um, and then we can um, put our pieces together. I'll get back to everyone on a, a schedule for the next meeting. Uh, well, actually, let's see something, Alan. Since we have everyone here and you're on the phone, I think still. Um, can we look at another potential date of um, this subcommittee uh, meeting on maybe like the 28th or something? Or that's, no, that's a holiday. Too late. Too late. Too late. So how about- the, If it's the 24th, you, you're gonna double check the dates anyway, right? You said the 24th was um, policy, right? Uh, policy, correct. We could get our policy recommendations to that committee, no problem by then. Um, because we've already just talked about them right here. Um, so if we got together on the 25th to flesh out the final pieces of the report, would that work? Alan? On the 25th of September? Yeah. Uh, we actually are booked that morning and that afternoon. And also because it wasn't in the calendar last time and the Senate calendar would be going out on Thursday the 24th, it wouldn't meet the 24 hour uh, notice legal requirement. How about the 29th? 29th. 29th, 10 a.m. is, no, actually, yeah, 29th is open, looks like, in the morning. We got 8 to noon it is available. How does 10 a.m. on the 29th sound? I'm out that week, but I will be working with you by email. Yeah, I can bring if you need me. Yeah. yeah. All right. So 29th, 10 a.m. Perfect. So we'll have each of our pieces in on the 29th. Um, if you could email them to me before the meeting, and then I'll put them into the full report that we can go over in the meeting, that would be great. And Mindy, you're going to send out a copy of that I am. PowerPoint too, right? I am. Thank you. As well as a couple of the other things that came in during the meeting. Great. I think that's good. Any other comments before we adjourn? Or I take a motion to adjourn, I should say. Nope. Thank you for moving us forward. Thank you guys for being patient about putting it together as we go under these circumstances. Um, okay, if no one else has any comments, um, I accept a motion, entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Thank you very much, Nancy Harrington. Second. Second. Nancy Olson Murphy, thank you very much. And uh, roll call to, um, we have to do a roll call, I believe Alan says. So can I have a roll call? Let's see. Um, you Gary are Thank you. Gary Woods? Uh, yes. Nancy Olson Murphy? Yes. Nancy Harrington? Yes. Representative Thomas? Yes. Katie Bush? Yes. And Amy Costello? Yes. Awesome. And I vote yes. We are officially adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Nancy, you'll uh, you'll contact.